All right, it's good to see you all here tonight. Take your Bibles, please. Open to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's good to see Mr. Paul Apple here. Brother Paul, I have to let you know that I've been on the website looking at some of your Bible material, and it's excellent. I was at the dinner with him, uh, Brother Paul and his dear wife, the other night with uh, Mark and Barbara. Uh, we went to a Korean barbecue place. I enjoyed it. I don't think anybody else did. <laughs> but, uh, Paul, Brother Paul did, but anyway... Um, just to let you all know, if you go to a, a website called Precept Austin, and, and uh, you, there's a lot of great material that Brother Paul has written, excellent stuff, and it has great outlines. And Brother Paul, I'm so glad you're here, but if you hear an outline that sounds familiar, you just have to remember it's mine now, even though it might be yours. I'm going to claim it and use it for myself. You have to agree to do that if you're going to come and listen to me, okay? Uh, also, uh, before we get started... Uh, I, I'm, I'm just so very proud of Aaron Finley because this week he will be graduating with his MDiv degree from Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. So he'll be, he'll be graduating uh, this week down in Tennessee, and uh, I'm going to go down there. I want to be a part of that. I want to see that. And, uh, and so I'm just so proud of him. And as a church, I want us all to celebrate together because there's a lot of work that goes into that. And here's what we're going to do. This is by pastoral decree here. Um, when we have our FTS graduation, we're going to honor Aaron as well on that night. Aaron, you're going to have to use that graduation gown two times because we want to recognize you at our FTS graduation. And afterwards, we're going to have a reception as well. And just to say congratulations for all the hard work and getting that master of divinity. There's a lot of work that goes into that, folks. Believe me, I know. And I'm just so very proud of him for that in a sanctified way. I'm very proud of Aaron for that. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 tonight, we're going to look at verses 8 down to verse number 13. And I want to talk about enduring hardness uh, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Look in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Now, in 2 Timothy, Paul has been encouraging Timothy to endure hardness. It would be very nice to say to you that once you come to Jesus Christ, it'll be all roses and no thorns. I know that there are some preachers out there that preach that kind of Pollyanna gospel. Uh, the problem with that is it's just simply a lie. The road to the celestial city is fraught with hardness and trials and difficulties, and sometimes things will happen in our life that will cast you into the depths of despair. The Christian life is not a 100-yard dash. It is a marathon. Uh, we may start out well, um, but the question is, are we able to endure over the long haul? And to, to really use that metaphor of, of athletics, it's more than just a marathon. It's, sometimes it's an obstacle course. And it takes everything we can to run in this race. And again, the question is, will you endure to the finish? Uh, will you be faithful through all the hardships that come to you in this life? And, and they will come, beloved. Uh, even unto death, even if it's uh, maybe in God's providence, who knows that death may come for the gospel, but for some believers... Every Christian wants to be able to say with the Apostle Paul when he said, I fought a good fight, I have finished the course, I've kept the faith. And God promises that we will not lose our salvation, but it's not automatic that every one of us at the end of our life can say those words and really mean it. In order for that to happen, we have to be faithful, we have to endure hardship. Now this is what Paul is in, uh, encouraging Timothy to do here in this passage of Scripture. He wants Timothy to endure hardship in the Christian life and for the sake of the gospel. Timothy was under pressure to compromise. As we had said before studying this letter, we learned that Timothy was somewhat of a timid and shy personality. He shied away from conflict and uh, other types of uh, difficulties. Many were turning against the Apostle Paul when he was in prison during this time of his life. You remember, this is the last letter that Paul will write, and soon after this, Paul will be a martyr. Uh, he'll go to heaven. And, and Paul wants Timothy to persevere. And so he's showing him how to endure when Timothy's tempted just to drop out. And maybe you've had that temptation in your own life just to, you know, when things don't go the way you want them to go, you just want to kind of quit and you kind of want to drop out. And so the question is, how can we endure hardness? How can we suffer and persevere? 
How can we be faithful to the gospel all the way up until the end? And that's my heart's desire. I want to be faithful to Christ. I know that in my own self, my own strength, I can't do that. We need to draw upon the resources of God to help us do that. And so Paul is going to give Timothy here four strategies for enduring hardship. And here's the first one. Number one, remember the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Look again in verse number eight. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, Paul exhorts Timothy to keep his mind focused on Jesus Christ. Notice the word remember. Remember Jesus Christ. That's the the way this phrase should be translated, in my opinion. Remember Jesus Christ. It almost sounds like a battle cry, like remember the Alamo or remember Pearl Harbor. Paul here is saying to Timothy, Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. And by the way, this is an imperative in the Greek, which simply means a command. Remember I told you there are several moods in Greek. Imperative is the mood of command. It's present tense, which means continual action. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, keep on continuing to remember Jesus Christ. Timothy, this is not a suggestion. This is a command. Stay focused on Christ. Paul has used present tense imperatives in this chapter. Actually, he's used them all throughout uh, first and Second Timothy, constantly where Paul is giving these gentle commands and their present tense, Timothy, do this, Timothy, do that. We see that all throughout the pastoral epistles. We see it here in this chapter here. Uh, already uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul said to Timothy, be strong, uh, present imperative, keep on continuing to be strong. In verse 2, he said, the things you heard from me among many witnesses, commit, that's another command, continue to commit these things. In verse 7, Paul wrote, consider, or that is keep on considering what I say, Timothy. Paul just gave Timothy illustrations of, of, of how to uh, be faithful, the illustration of a, of a soldier, the illustration of a, uh, a farmer and an athlete. And and Paul says, just keep on thinking about that. Consider what I say. Verse 14, put them in remembrance of these things. Talking about the the people of God. Um, We're to constantly put people in remembrance of this. And then also study in verse 15, or be diligent. In verse 16, shun or avoid. In verse 19, depart from iniquity. In verse 22, flee youthful lusts. Keep on continuing to flee youthful lusts. In verse 23, avoid foolish and unlearned questions. You get the idea? That's just chapter 2. <laughs> and all of the pastoral epistles are filled with these uh, present tense imperatives where Paul is saying to Timothy, just keep doing this. Just do this. Now, these are gentle commands, but still they are commands. And if you want to be faithful and productive in your spiritual life, these are things that you must do. All these things really characterize the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in verse number 8 here, we see this imperative, keep remembering Jesus Christ. Now, beloved, this is the basic rule of the Christian life, is it not? This is how we live our Christian life. We keep remembering Christ. We keep him always in our mind. Uh, That's the basic rule. John reminds us in 1 John 2, 6, He that saith he abideth in him ought also to walk even as he walked. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 12, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, we get into the Christian life by looking to Jesus in salvation, Well, we'll end the Christian life by looking in the face of Jesus. Wouldn't that be a wonderful time when we go and see Jesus and see him face to face? And the key to the in-between is just keeping focused on Christ. Keep looking to Jesus. The preeminence of our Lord should always be on our mind. He was the greatest soldier. He was the greatest athlete. He was the greatest farmer, as it were. He fought the greatest battle, and he won the greatest victory. He ran the greatest race. He won the greatest prize. He sowed the perfect seed and reaped the perfect harvest. He is our example. We look to him continually. Now, if anyone can teach us how to endure hardness, it's Jesus. Jesus can do that. And so Paul focuses here two things about Jesus. First of all, his humanity. Notice what he says about him in verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David... 
Now, Paul focuses here on his humanity. Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. That's one thing that Paul uh, is alluding to here when he talks about Jesus being of the seed of David. But it also is emphasizing the fact that he was a man. Jesus was fully man. Therefore, Jesus suffered as a man, just as we suffered. And whatever you go through in life, you can know this, that you have a Savior who understands how, how you feel. He knows. He, he himself was a man, fully man, fully human. And the Bible says in Hebrews 5a, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And so Jesus suffered all during his earthly life. Of course, we know his greatest suffering came during that Passion Week when he suffered and died for our sins. But Jesus suffered many things during his earthly existence. And he is the one that we look to. If we become discouraged in the midst of our sufferings, we must focus our minds on the author of our salvation because I want to tell you something, friend. Nobody suffered to any, any greater than Jesus. He suffered the greatest in the time that he was here, and yet he came out of it victorious. He is our assurance of final victory over all of our sufferings as well. Jesus' path to glory was marked by pain before pleasure. And that's something we need to keep in mind. Sorrow before joy, humiliation before glorification, persecution before exaltation, death before resurrection, earthly hatred before heavenly worship. And to re- we are to remember these things. And if we remember these things about Jesus Christ, it will re- protect us from foolish and ungodly promises of the so-called health and wealth gospel that says that, you know, you're supposed to live every day of your life as a Christian now free of any kind of sickness or any kind of problem or any kind of hardship. And beloved, that's a false gospel. The way you keep yourself from believing that kind of a false gospel is to keep on looking to Jesus Christ. But also he mentions his resurrection, who was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And this literally reads, having been raised from the dead. This, of course, you know, is the foundation upon which Christianity rests, the great truth upon which Paul focuses, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said, I deliver unto you that which I receive, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This is of first importance, this truth here, and this is the basis for all of our victory in this life, victory over death, I know that in this life, it's, it could be tough. It could be difficult. And we have faced a lot of fears as Christians. What's the greatest fear that we face? Death. But as a believer, that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have victory over that. We have victory over the greatest fear that mankind has because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection proves that suffering leads to glory. So in order to endure hardness... Paul says, Timothy, remember Jesus Christ of the seed of David. Remember, Timothy, that he was a man. Remember, Timothy, that he suffered too, and he was victorious over all his sufferings. Keep your focus on Christ. But here's number two. Not only remember the preeminence of Jesus Christ, but number two, remember the power of the Word of God. Look at verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even on the bonds but the word of God is not bound. And here Paul points to the power of God's word. Here he's saying, Timothy, remember the power of the word of God. Any suffering that we do in our ministry, Timothy, because of the word of God, it's worth it. It's worth it. Any suffering we have to do to to, uh, help the word of God have free course, that's, that's worth it. God may allow ministers to go through suffering to make them more effective in the ministry and delivery of the Word. And if that's the case, Paul is testifying to Timothy, Timothy is worth it. God might call upon us to have to suffer. If my suffering results in the furtherance and spread of the Word of God, then so be it. And Paul knew that the reason he was in prison was because of the sufferings of the of the hardship of his life was because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I noticed verse 9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. 
And this points back to what Paul previously said at the end of verse 8, according to my gospel. Because of Paul's gospel, which is the gospel, Paul was in prison and he was suffering. He suffered trouble here. This, uh, again, comes from the Greek word uh, that means endure hardness. Paul is enduring hardness because of the gospel. In other words, his present difficulties in a Roman dungeon, I promise you it wasn't like a five-star hotel, is what part of what he had in mind when he talked about suffering as uh, an evildoer. And when it says evildoer here, the Romans looked upon him as an evildoer. Can you imagine that? According to the Roman government, Paul was an evildoer. If Paul was an evildoer, pray tell, what were the ones who were really out there doing evil? But this shows the animosity at that time that the Roman government had against Christians. Ramsey points out that the word here used is a direct reference to the shameful crimes of which Christians were condemned during the reign of Nero. This is a word that refers to Christians uh, specifically during that time. Who were Christians? According to the Romans, they were evildoers. Again, that's incredible to think about. We're living in a day when the word Christian is no longer looked upon in a positive way. And and it's getting more and more like that. I think I told you before I was asked to lead in prayer at the State Senate of Maryland. Uh, They they asked me to do that, and I said, you know, of course, I'll, I'll go down there and do it. And they said, would you please submit your prayer in advance? I said, sure. So I I wrote out the prayer and submitted it. And then they called me on the phone. Up until this time, we're just doing emails. But then when they got the prayer, they called me on the phone. And they said, "Uh, Reverend Harmon, um, you can't use the name Jesus in your prayer. I said, really? I said, well, what what do you think prayer is? And uh, I said, I will not be a part of that hypocrisy. Any prayer that does not call upon Jesus or is, is done in Jesus' name is not real prayer at all. It's not real prayer at all. Since when did the name of Jesus become something that cannot be spoken? But that's the way it's becoming in our world. The name Christian or follower of Christ is not looked upon in a positive way anymore. Now, I had people come up to me and said, oh, well, you could have done this and you could have done that. You mean lie? I'm not going to play part of a hypocritical game just to be able to say that I prayed a prayer in a state senate of Maryland. I'm not out there to try. I'm not a politician, beloved. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm called to proclaim his word. The only hope that this world has is Jesus Christ, and you want me to leave his name out of a prayer? You can forget that. Anyway, but... That's why Paul was in prison by the Roman government. In verse number 9, again, he says, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. When he says even unto bonds, again, he's talking about this prison where he was placed in chains. But here, Paul does something so very beautiful in this verse. He makes a contrast with his imprisonment and the freedom of the word of God to work. But look what he says in the rest of verse number 9. But the word of God is not bound. I love that. You can put God's servant in prison, but you're not going to put God's word in prison. You can't bind God's word. You might be able to put the servant in jail, and you might think that you're actually stopping the word of God from going out. But I got news for you. Putting God's servant in prison might cause the word of God to go out even more. You can't put the word of God in prison. You may try, And I think this is what Paul means here. I think what Paul is saying is, look, me being in prison doesn't mean that the Word of God is imprisoned. In fact, the Word of God is not bound. In other words, it's free to move on, and it is moving on. It's doing greater things. I think Paul had the same thing in mind when uh, he wrote to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 12. Uh, In fact, why don't you just turn there, would you? Go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. 
And look down at verse number 12. Now, it's the same kind of condition. This is not the same imprisonment. This is the first imprisonment of Paul. When we come to 2 Timothy, that is the second Roman imprisonment. But here's the first Roman imprisonment, and look what it says in verse number 12. But I would have you understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So the church at Philippi, they were wondering where Paul was. This was a very giving church. They were supporting him. And for a while, for a while there, they, they didn't know where he was, and they found out later that Paul was in a Roman prison, and they were concerned about that because a, a person put in a Roman prison uh, has to really take care of their own needs. People from the outside have to give to them in order for them just to have the necessities to live. So the church of Philippi got together a big gift and they sent it to Paul by way of Epaphroditus when they found Paul there in prison. And Epaphroditus shared with Paul while he was there in prison the concern that the church had over Paul. And one of the questions they had in their mind that they seemed to be anxious about and worried about was that the fact that Paul was in prison, one of God's greatest servants, if not the greatest living servant of the Lord at that time, was now put in a prison and he had been there for two, two years? Why would God put his great servant in a prison and keep him there? And they were wondering, what was happening to the gospel effort? What was happening to the word of God? Was it bound? Was it in prison because Paul was in prison? And Paul corrects that thinking when he says in verse 12, the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the what? Furtherance of the gospel. Me being in prison hasn't hindered the gospel, Paul says, me being in prison has actually served to further the gospel. In fact, the fact that I'm here in this Roman prison means that the gospel is now spreading in places where it would never have the opportunity to spread if I were not here in these chains. And look at verse number 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Now, the word for palace here is the Greek word praetorion, and it refers to Caesar's elite praetorian guards. These were the, you could say, the green beret of the Roman soldiers. These were the ones that were Caesar's personal guards, his personal troops, and um, they were kind of the secret service of that day. And while Paul was in Rome, he had one of these praetorian guards assigned to him all the time. Um, they, they served like seven-hour shifts. Every seven hours, they would chain a new uh, guard to the apostle Paul. Now, you can imagine in your mind what would happen by, be, by this guard being chained to Paul for seven hours, seven hours. In fact, I would volunteer for that assignment. I'd like to be chained to him for seven hours. I'd like to talk to him for seven hours. And these guys were listening to this apostle. They, they heard his prayers, perhaps saw the tears that he prayed. While he prayed, they uh, maybe heard him <laughs> dictate some letters to people. Paul had a little bit of freedom. He was under house arrest there while he was in Rome so that the people in Rome could actually come and visit him while he was there. He just couldn't leave. Everywhere he went, he had to have a praetorian guard chained to him. And so these guys were listening to Paul, and some of them were converting to Jesus Christ and when they got their seven-hour shift done, they were going back to the barracks saying, hey, any of you guys get chained to that Paul guy? Isn't he something else? And so what was happening is these elite uh, guards of Caesar were hearing the gospel, and they would never hear the gospel any other way unless one of God's greatest servants was in chains. In Ephesians 6.20, Paul referred to himself as an ambassador in chains. The word for chains here uh, is speaking about handcuffs at each end of a chain that's 18 inches long. And so, and this was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, shift changes constantly. These guys are hearing Paul, and they're hearing the gospel, and they're getting saved, and, they're, and, the, and the word of God is reaching all the way up into Caesar's palace. You can chain the messenger. 
but you're not going to change the Word of God. You're not going to change the gospel. So the question is, you know, what does God change you to? Because he wants the gospel to spread from wherever you are. And so Paul's imprisonment was actually producing conversions, but also it was provoking courage. Look at verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Not only was people on the inside, Roman soldiers, getting saved because Paul was there, but also the brethren, that's talking about believers, they were much more bold. Paul's imprisonment and seeing what Paul was doing there in prison actually encouraged, gave them courage to be more bold for Jesus Christ, even in the midst of a very difficult environment where a tyrant like Nero was on the throne. And Paul said, me being here in prison is causing my brethren to to wax confident, to be bold, to speak the word without fear. And so Paul was infusing courage into other believers to share the gospel because he was there in prison. He was bound, but the word of God was not bound. And I think this is what Paul has in mind when uh, Paul talks about to Timothy, Timothy, I might be here in this prison, but the word of God is not bound. Think about the power of of the Word of God. And my sufferings are actually increasing the effectiveness of God's Word. Do you ever think of it that way? That when God allows you at times to suffer, that He's doing it in order to increase the flow of God's Word in your realm of influence or even beyond that? So Paul says, Timothy, remember the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Remember the power of of the Word of God. But then here's the third thing Paul says. Timothy, remember the purpose of the work. Look at verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now Paul is reminding Timothy of the divine purpose of the Lord's work. And what is that? That's the salvation of lost souls. And Paul was willing to go through any suffering in order to see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The word therefore kind of points back. We could translate it for this reason. Paul says, for this reason I endure all of this. I'm willing to endure all things. Why? To what purpose? In verse 10, for the elect's sake that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Those things gave Paul the motivation to endure all things so that unbelievers to whom he witnessed might obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. His heart reflected the heart of God, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, Paul knew that There was salvation in no other name than the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. There is none other. And the Bible was abundantly clear on that. And the Bible makes clear also, as we see here in this verse, both the sovereignty of God in salvation as well as the responsibility of man. In salvation, these are two sides of the same coin. And we see it here in this verse. I I see this very clearly here. Paul calls those who will believe the elect. Who are those who are the elect? These are believers. These are the ones who will believe. The Bible says God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Listen to Ephesians 1, verse number 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Our salvation is, et- is settled in eternity past. Now, there are some who would take a verse like this, and they become fatalistic interpreters and say, well, evangelism is not necessary. And, uh, you know, it's no, it's no use offering the, the gospel to anyone, you know, since God has an elect. 
and they disregard other passages of Scripture that teach the responsibility of man, that talk about whosoever will may come. Listen to Romans 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And so we see both of these in Scripture, don't we? God's word is just as clear on the necessity for faith, person exercising faith for salvation, as, as it does that the salvation is by God's sovereign grace. Both of these things are equally taught and equally true in Scripture. Jesus said, no man can come to me unless the Father which sent me draw him. But Jesus also said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, you say, well, you know, that, you know, how, how can that reckon in our minds? I mean, that doesn't reason out in our minds how both of these things can be true. And the fact that our finite minds cannot fully understand or reconcile these truths in no way negates their validity. Both of these things are true, okay? Don't ask me to harmonize them because God never asked me to do that. God will harmonize it all one day when we get to heaven. The great musician will harmonize all the notes on the gamut. We don't have to worry about that. We just have to do what God has commanded us to do. And what, what is unclear about the Great Commission? We are to take the gospel to who? Every creature, everyone, every creature. And yet we know that God is sovereign in all this, and yet we also know that man is fully responsible. And this is, again, a concept that you may have heard me talk about before. It's called concurrence, where these two things seem like they are a paradox or they seem contradictory. Notice the word seem there. They're not. We can't reason it out in our mind, but that's okay. Faith is reason at rest in God. I don't have, it all doesn't have to figure out for me. And let me tell you something. Whenever you start getting into a problem-solving venture when it comes to theology, which most arrogant theologians do, they have to have an answer to everything, satisfy their intellect. And when you get into that mode, you ultimately either bring God down to your level or you exalt man up to a level he doesn't belong. And I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to embrace the truth of Scripture and understand that both of these things are true. And you say, well, you can't explain it to me. I'm not going to believe it. Okay. I can't explain to you how Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, but I still believe that. I believe both of those things are true. And I can't explain how it works together, and neither can you, and neither can any other theologian. And when any of them have tried to do that, to harmonize that, again, they wander off into heresy. And the same thing happens with regard to this doctrine of salvation. Whenever I hear someone preach on it, there are some who are so heavy on sovereignty, they make, it make feel like the, you know, people are robots, like we don't have any decision in this. So we have people that are all the way over here on sovereignty, and that's all they talk about. And by the way, I believe that God is sovereign. I glory in the sovereignty of God. I rest my head on the pillow of God's sovereignty. I believe in that. But I also believe that man is fully responsible. And all the decisions that you make are real decisions, so much so that you will be judged for every decision you make. But if you think that any decision you make can overturn the purpose of God, you don't know God. God's big enough. To, and he's sovereign, not you and your decisions. And again, this might not all reason out in our mind, but that's okay. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So I'm at rest in all of that. But Paul wasn't a fatalist. He believed in God's sovereignty and salvation, but he wasn't a fatalist. You say, why? Well, because he says, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they might obtain salvation. Well, Paul, if we're going to get saved anyway, why go through all that? Why, why go through all the suffering? Why go be a missionary and go to places where they throw stones at you and leave you for dead? Why go through all of that? 
If, if, if it, God already has his elect and it's going to happen no matter what happens, that's, not, that's a fatalistic, unbiblical attitude. That's not in Scripture. We are to take the gospel to everyone. And if anyone dies, they should have to step over the body of a Christian on their knees pleading with them to come to Jesus Christ if they're not already saved. I believe that with all my heart. And so Paul says, you know, I endure all things for the elect's sake because the purpose of the work is the salvation of others. And Timothy, if our suffering will bring salvation to those who otherwise would never have it, then that's a good thing. I'm willing to endure all things so that salvation can come to unbelievers, so that they can know Jesus Christ. Think about some of the great heroes of the past and the work that they did. John Wesley traveled by foot or horseback for 250,000 miles, preaching more than 40,000 sermons. He wrote and translated and edited more than 200 books. That's before uh, word processors or iPads. He lived simple. He gave away most of what income he received. He was continually mocked and ridiculed and pelted with stones by ungodly mobs. He was ostracized by the clergymen of the Church of England. He was maligned. And when asked about it, he just simply said, you know, I leave my reputation where I left my soul in the hands of God. And he just continued on being faithful in the work of God, enduring hardship for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you the final point here. How do we endure hardness? Well, we remember the preeminence of Jesus Christ. We remember the power of the Word of God. We remember the purpose of the work. But finally, we remember the promise of eternal blessing. Look at verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we believe with him, we shall also live with him. Or excuse me, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. This is a faithful saying. We see this expression five times in the pastoral epistles. It's found nowhere else in the New Testament. And when Paul uses this expression, he's reminding believers of something that they already knew. That's why he's saying, this is a faithful saying. Or we could say, this is something that you, you know well. And he may be quoting from an ancient creed of the early church, or he may be quoting something that was axiomatic, an honorable saying that was often said in the early church. Or I, I think more accurately, the parallelism and the rhythm that we see in these verses makes it more likely that what Paul's doing is he's quoting from a hymn, a hymn that was sung in the early church. You know, I do that sometimes. I love some of the hymns. I'll quote from them. Preachers do that. Um, I'll, give, I'll give you a story. I was over in, uh, well, I don't know if I, well, I'll tell you this. But anyway, because um, time is late, and I'm just kind of sharing stuff here. But anyway, um, when I went to uh, Korea before, and I was doing a, a seminar with some pastors there, I, I had David Smith with me. David Smith is the... Uh, he is the director of the Museum of the Book in London. He has incredible Bibles. Um, I mean, the museum in Washington got bought half of their Bibles from David. He's on our board of Faith Theological Seminary, and he wanted to go with me, and he wanted to just put out some Bibles on display wherever we went. And um, he had Spurgeon's pulpit Bible. Um, can you imagine that, having Spurgeon's pulpit Bible? And uh, he had it out there on display, and we were talking in between a session, and we were just flipping through Spurgeon's Bible, and there was a little piece of paper in there in purple ink in Spurgeon's handwriting. Now, David had never seen this before, and he was shocked. I could tell he was stunned because Spurgeon wrote with a purple ink pen. Everything he wrote was in purple ink. And here's this little card, a little piece of paper, and it was written in there, written, something written on it, and then just slipped in the Bible. And it was a beautiful poem. And what we later found out was it was a hymn that people loved to sing in that day. And Spurgeon, who didn't preach with notes, 
He was, had such a giant intellect. He didn't need it. It's not fair. I mean, I'm going to tell God, God, why? I need notes. This guy, he could preach without them. He was just an incredible intellect, but he had this little hymn written on this note. Evidently, in a sermon, he used that, referenced that, and slipped it into the pulpit Bible, forgot about it. And then here we are. We discovered this. This is like a priceless treasure to us boring historical people, you know. But anyway, getting back to the point, Paul here is quoting from an ancient hymn. And the whole idea of this hymn is the idea of martyrdom. This was a daily reality in the minds of the early believers. In fact, again, after Paul finishes this letter, he will shortly become a martyr himself. So maybe this is why this hymn was on his mind. And again, just just think about the words of this. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. (laughs) That's the martyr's hope. That's our hope. We're believers, and one day we die, you know what? We will be alive in Christ. We'll be alive in him. We'll share eternal glory with our Lord Jesus Christ. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. Suffering sometimes leads to greater glory if we suffer well. That's why we have nothing to fear. And Jesus warns his disciples about that. But there's also a warning here in this where it says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. In that great roll call in glory when the medals are given out, I don't want to lose my reward because I in any way denied him or disowned his name. So this hymn, and no doubt, was inspiring. Again, remember the context. These are believers living in Rome under the reign of Nero. Martyrdom and death was a daily reality. And in this hymn, Paul says, as he's quoting it, if we deny him, he also will deny us. And if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Here's one thing that we can know. Even if we're faithless by not enduring hardship, we might lose our rewards. But because of his faithfulness to his promises, we will never lose our salvation. We'll never lose that. We're still saved. Why? He cannot deny himself. You are so much a part of Jesus. He will not deny you. He, in doing that, he would deny himself, and he will never do that. But the whole message is, of this hymn, it's designed to inspire believers to be faithful unto death, be faithful and receive eternal glory, eternal glory that awaits those that are faithful to Jesus Christ. And I'll close with this. I read this story, and I thought it was so fascinating, I wanted to share it with you. Several years ago, Bible translators Bruce and Jan Benson and their 14-year-old son were driving on a mountainside in the Peruvian Andes, and as they came around a switchback, they came bumper to bumper with a truckload of terrorists, rebels known as the Shining Path. Men jumped out of the truck, brandishing automatic rifles, surrounding the Benson's car, and ordered them to get out. And Jan thought, this is it. This is the end of our lives. The terrorists took him to a nearby town. On the way, fearful and bewildered, Jan felt the need to pray and then sing. And then she said, you know, it began as a trickle. It seemed like the Lord was saying, you know, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. But then she thought in her mind and protested, but Lord, I don't know how I can praise you right now. And then the thought came to her mind, sing, just sing. At least you can sing. And so she began to sing. You are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. And other songs began to flow. And suddenly, she felt as though she was the only person alive on earth. It was just her and God. And she felt his all-compassing love and presence and assurance that he was in control. Not even death could remove her from that feeling of peace there in his presence. That night, the rebels unexpectedly released the Bensons, but they confiscated the car, their portable projection equipment, and a film reel of the new media Bible from Luke, 
Gospel of Luke, the same film material that basically made up the Jesus film. One year later, the Bensons were living in a capital city for safety, and Jan received a phone call. One of the captors had become a Christian and wanted to meet with him. And when they met, he told them that he was an experienced killer and that he and the others had planned to kill them that night. He said, but for some reason, they just could not do it and decided to release him instead. Then the rebels set up the projector and watched the film. (laughs) Many times they watched the film. They watched it over and over. At at one viewing, several hundred rebels were watching and listening to God's word in their own language. Many were so moved that they wanted to lay down their weapons right there and leave the shining path. Standing before them as a fellow believer, their former enemy said to them, please forgive me for my part in what we did to you that day. The Bensons were able to go back to that village finish the translation of the New Testament into that language. God's witnesses may have been bound, but the word of God was not bound. And God's word will never, ever be bound. Let's bow for prayer together. Father, thank you for the encouragement that we receive from your word how that we can endure hardness. We know that in this life can be difficult. There's a lot of adversity, a lot of pain that we have to endure, a lot of suffering. And yet, Lord, you give us the resources, the divine resources to be faithful. It is your presence, knowing you, remembering who you are, knowing the power of your word that it does its work, knowing, Lord, that you have eternal purposes that you are bringing to pass in and through us, and knowing that there really is an eternal glory that we get to share. This isn't all there is. This is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that we will get one day if we're faithful. So, Lord, help us. We're weak, and we confess that. But, Lord, we know that you are so gracious, always ready to come by our side, to pick us up, give us the grace and the strength that we need. And so, Lord, I pray that for all of these, your beloved people tonight, Lord, give strength where it's needed. Help us to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And we pray in his matchless name.